OK, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about the results of my PhD on um, the evolution of the respiratory system in oxals. And particularly, I'm interested in the evolution of the mechanics of ventilation, so how actually do these things breathe? Um, to do that, I spend a lot of my time staring at the rib cages of birds and hoping the answer will come to me. Um, I was doing that before, I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, so birds breathe using uh, costal aspiration. So they breathe using the motion of their ribs and of their sternum to effect change in the volume of their thoracic cavity and uh, uh, actually ventilate their lungs. Um, birds are quite interesting. They have a very specialized and highly, quite highly constrained rib cage compared to most of the amniotes. Um, and I'm interested in how variation in ribcage form affects variation in ribcage function and the mechanics of ventilation to taxa. And I do a lot of this using computational mathematical modeling, but a bit of a problem I've had is that a lot of the previous work that's tried to model the motion of the ribcage in birds has been in 2D. Um, birds do not breathe in two dimensions, sadly, um, unfortunately for me. Um, and so we need a new 3D way of modeling the rib cage and trying to tackle this question. And so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. I've been developing uh, new 3D modeling approaches, uh, uh, mostly with some collaborators in the US. And I'm mostly, gonna, I'm mostly today going to be talking to you about uh, some applications of these models, because the actual model development was mostly the work of my collaborator, Aaron Olson. But I've been using uh, Aaron's models and uh, also collaborating with some other people on a couple of projects so I'm going to talk to you today. Uh, first one is a sort of broad ecomorphological project comparing form and function in different taxa. And then the second one is a muscle function project looking at uh, intercostal muscle architecture and how we can use these models to start probing some questions on breathing muscles. So the first one um, is the comparative project across birds. And this is looking at variation form function in different bird taxa. There's a lot of variation in form in bird taxa. We've known about this for quite some time in the rib cage. And quite a lot of this has been noted to be down to differences in how they move. So uh, at the top, you have a cassowary that runs. In the middle, you have an eagle owl that flies. And at the bottom, you have some razor bills that dive. And their rib cages are very different. They move in very different ways. And this link has been noted previously. And I wanted to know whether there's actual variation in function as well as form and whether this is tied to locomotion. And the hypothesis I've kind of been working with is that birds with more energetically demanding forms of locomotion, so flying as opposed to walking, might have rib cages better optimized to maximize gas exchange and well, ga uh, gas flow so they can get more air in, more oxygen in, and support this more metabolically demanding uh, locomotor habit. So do you see? an increase in the efficiency of the rib cage as you go through these different locomotor modes. Um, how do you actually quantify locomotion? So we decided to use wing aspect ratio. This has been around for a long time, and people have been using it as a long time as a way of categorizing birds into different flight styles and locomotor modes. And so how do you get a rib cage? Well, I've been working with Stephanie Baumgart at the Field Museum, who's part of the OVERT project. It stands for open vertebrate. It's a giant consortium of museums across the US who are scanning all the things, all of them. Uh, and Stephanie has been getting all the birds for me. So I've been scanning a lot of birds. I've then been taking these scans, um, making models of the rib cage, and then putting on anatomical landmarks that define uh, joints and articulation points. And these are what we use to build the linkage model. And the metric of choice for making comparisons cross taxa is this thing called expansion advantage, which is kind of like a sort of, it's, it's a way of measuring how much expansion or contraction, how much volume change you get in a rib cage for a given uh, input motion. And this input motion we're using is just the motion of the sternum. So if you move the sternum by a given amount, how much volume change do you get in the rest of the rib cage as a result? Um, with the idea being that you have a high expansion advantage, then it doesn't take a lot of sternum motion or a lot of input to get a lot of uh, gas flow through your system. And so we expected expansion advantage to be higher in birds with uh, that more metabolically, more metabolically demanding locomotor style. So flyers as opposed to walkers, for example. Um, that's not what happened. Uh, so this graph, uh, I don't have the biggest sample yet, because although over are uh, scanning all the things, they have not yet scanned all the things. Um, and so the sample I've got at the moment isn't quite as big as I'd like, but it covers a pretty broad range of flight styles, and it's got fa a fairly broad phylogenetic coverage. Um, and there is no pattern whatsoever. Uh, 
one thing that does jump out at me is that the very obvious outlier in all of this is, uh, the, is uh, my one flightless bird, which is a cassowary. Um, and that kind of got me thinking um, about whether the rib cage actually works with ventilation and locomotion or whether they're competing against one another. And I went back to some of that previous work and actually um, worked on by my supervisor, John Cotter in Manchester, and looking at certain features of the rib cage. And they said that, yes, these are correlated with locomotor mode, but they're trying to get around constraints of locomotion. They're not, and actually deal with the fact that, say, for example, if you're a diving bird, then you need um, a streamlined body form. Your rib cage is quite constrained by the way you move. And so it's not necessarily actually being optimized for, um, for its role in ventilation, and it's being constrained by all the factors. So my new question is, does locomotion actually constrain ribcage function as opposed to the other way around? And yes, maybe the ribcage is optimized for ventilation, but it's within these constraints placed by flight, swimming, etc. cetera. Um, I'm now gonna move on to the other project I mentioned at the beginning, which is about using these models to probe intercostal muscle function. Uh, the intercostal muscles have been a pain for quite some time. Uh, people have been arguing about their function ever since ancient Rome. Galen mentioned them in 200 AD. Da Vinci mentioned them in the Renaissance. Um, and they're quite unique in that you can't tell just by looking at them what they do because the intercostal span of space across two ribs and so whether a given muscle is going to shorten or lengthen during inspiration or expiration depends on uh, the angle of the muscle fiber, the shape of the two ribs, how they move relative to one another, and is complicated by the fact that all of those three things vary both within an intercostal space and across the rib cage. Um, so just simple lengthening or shortening of any given fascicle, you can't actually tell just from the anatomy what it's gonna do. But people have tried to get around this by using EMG, so electromyography, which can tell you when a muscle is electrically active, but there's still issues with the fact that it, muscles can only do work if they're actively contracting. So a muscle can only be contributing to ventilation if it's both on and it's contracting. And EMG only tells you one of those things. And whether a muscle is contracting or not um, is particularly problematic in locomotion because a lot of these breathing muscles get co-opted to just stabilize the rib cage when animals are walking. But even at rest, um, in birds at least, it's been suggested that birds don't breathe with their muscles, but they do. It's been suggested that basically birds just let the sternum fall under gravity and then the muscles are lengthening, but still on and contracting and acting to break the fall of the sternum but the muscles aren't actually moving the sternum. I personally don't really buy this, but it is a hypothesis that has been put forward in the literature. And so I thought I'd test that and actually see whether you can tell whether or not the muscles are gonna shorten or lengthen. And we can do this using these models because what you can do is you can not only simulate um, the joints, but you can also simulate points between them. You can simulate every a load of points along a rib. You can string a hypothetical muscle fiber between those two points. And then you can measure the relative motion of those two points and see how that muscle fiber changes in length um, as the volume of the rib cage changes and as you move from inspiration to expiration. And then you can also model how muscle function changes uh, depending on fiber angle and position of the rib cage, um, which is what the, the animation is showing. Uh, so the red fibers have um, a high expiratory mechanical advantage. They shorten a lot um, during expiration for breathing out. And the blue ones have a high inspiratory mechanical advantage. They shorten a lot during breathe, you know, for breathing in. Um, and so you can see uh, how this just changes across the rib cage. And if you compare that to results that we have from EMG, um, then it actually matches quite nicely. So the external intercostals, uh, as external I see there, um, they're generally on during inspiration. And they also, and if you, the, muscles with a similar fiber angle to in what we know the fiber angle of the external intercostals is from dissection. Uh, they also have, a very, they shorten during inspiration, so they have an inspiratory mechanical advantage. Uh, the internal intercostals are generally on during expiration, they have an expiratory mechanical advantage. And then the same is true of the parasternals, they're on during inspiration, they have inspiratory mechanical advantage. These results actually gel quite nicely with what we already knew from the EMG data. So just conclude, um, these are just some very preliminary results uh, from this project, which is only really just starting. Um, it's actually generating probably more questions than it's answered so far. Uh, so from the ecomorphology project, how does locomotion affect things? How does locomotion interplay with ventilation to explain the patterns that we're actually seeing? 
Um, we're going to get more birds. We're going to increase sampling. We're going to look at more um, phylogenetic groups, broader ecologies, et cetera, to try to classify things slightly differently. And uh, I'm actually really excited by the, um, these muscle modeling applications that I've also got these models to go with. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Aaron and Stephanie, without whom this project would have been entirely impossible. Um, the University of Manchester for hosting me, the BBSRC for funding me. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Any questions? Thank you.